And now we'll switch the gear to the second part, which is to objectively quantify cognitive effort in sickle cell disease. Now, when we talk about cognitive decline in sickle cell disease, we have to talk about stroke because the stroke, it is believed to be the cause of cognitive decline in sickle cell disease. And there are many studies have found that the stroke actually occurred on the, uh, the frontal part of the brain, where it's usually known as high level control center for decision making, arithmetic, short term memory, and so forth. This is one study that showed association between the stroke severity and intelligence quotient, or so-called IQ. You can see it's much lower in sickle cell disease with history of stroke. There are also similar findings in terms of academic difficulties, lower employment rate, and so on. But so far, there are only evidences based on static images, rather, and these uh, behavioral scores so we propose differently in order to better understand the disease processes in relation to their stroke and cognitive decline and so forth we suggest to look at the brain in action in our case there would be functional brain imaging data that means how does disease impact the activation of the brain during cognitive tasks okay so here's our guy again and this time he has functional near infrared spectroscopy, in short as FNIRS. And you can see there's capnography measuring the CO2 concentration as he breathed, and also photoplethysmography or PPG. The hypothesis was sickle cell disease patients would use more brain power than non sickle cell disease subjects when doing the same cognition task. So let's go over the principle of the FNIRS, which can measure the changes in the brain oxygenation by using red lights at two wavelengths. As you can see here, our body tissue and bones are relatively transparent to red light. And from the device, the light is, can be beamed through the forehead and it comes out to a receiver and we measure the intensity of that light. And the changes of that intensity would depending on how much the light is absorbed by the content in the tissue, such as the hemoglobin content or red blood cells in the bloodstream. And as you can see from this table, different wavelength of lights are absorbed differently to the hemoglobin depending on whether they are carrying oxygen or not. So oxy and deoxy here. So by using at least two wavelengths of lights, we can solve for the changes in oxy and deoxy as a function of time. And this correlates with the brain activity. And this is a picture of the portable wearable FNIRS band that we use. And you can see there are four emitters in the middle. And each one lights up by taking turns and the surrounding receivers forming 16, a total of 16 channels um, over the forehead. And with the FNIRS monitoring, we utilize a working memory task called NBAC. And you can see that to score, the subject has to press a button if the current letter is the same as the one showing at the N step back. So this means the subject is consistently memorizing the letters from the past. And this NBAC is known to cause the changes, cause changes in brain ox oxygenation. So zero back means you press a button when there's a pre-specified letter. This case is X. One back means if the letter is same as one back turn before, then you press. And this is case is, is two back, as you can see. So you press a button when the current letter show, showing is the same as two turns back. And due to MBAC, this is what we would expect. The reaction time will increase as the MBAC difficulty increases. And the accuracy rate will go down and the brain oxygenation will change more. This is our study setup. We have five minute resting period, it means it's a quiet recording without any task, followed by an back memory test with four difficulties with three trials for each task. And each of the difficulties will be ordered randomly. And the whole task took about 15 minutes. And we have group of sickle cell disease patients and group of control subjects. And within the sickle cell disease patients, we had patient with history of stroke. Now let's take a look at the signal of one example subject. 
You see the first row showed different levels of tasks are digitally marked from the computer. And here I'm showing two channels from Daphneer's channel two and channel seven. And this is particularly HBO, oxygenated hemoglobin. So you can see there was a constant trend of increase on both channels. And the fourth row actually showed the change in systemic perfusion measured by finger PPG. In this case, we took the amplitude of each pulse ox or PPG signal, which can be indicative of vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And you can see during the test, there's a prolonged vasoconstriction. This suggests that sympathetic nervous system was uh, activated. And you can see the end tidal CO2 patterns. And it's not zoomed in, but if, if you see these dips, that's actually where the CO2 was lower, meaning that they, the subject had deep breath. Now, how do we quantify the brain activity during this mental work? What we've done was we computed the slope of the fitted line. So here's what I meant by that. The tracing on top here shows the changes in HBO, the oxygenation of the brain over the whole study period. Different levels of the end bag was marked in different color and the numbers. You can see zero bags are in blue, three bags are in this pink. And now for all the zero bags, we collect them and fit a slope or fit a line. You can see that for this easy task, the slopes are negative. Now for one bag and two bag, three bag, when we do the same thing, you can see the slope gradually increases. So that slope was what we quantified. Now look, there was one interesting problem. This one particular subject expected that increase in slope. So zero back, one back, two back, fine. But then three back, where we expected the most in increase in slope, but then there's a big dip here. That really hurt our anticipated high slope. Why is this the case? And it turned out that this pattern was also shown in the peripheral blood flow that we measured. In this case is the PPG amplitude, which showed the same pattern. And this suggested that the original FNIRS measurement here might have been contaminated by external influences such as scalp blood flow or skin blood flow that are not from the brain itself. So how do we solve this problem? So first, let's quickly go over this slide. How the FNIRS work is that we anticipate the increase in the oxygenated hemoglobin while there's a small decrease in deoxygenated hemoglobin when there's a brain activity. It's called neurovascular coupling. And this is basically recruitment of more blood flow or fresh blood flow. Now, this can be confounded by a number of things such as skin or scalp blood flow and CO2 in the brain. For example, you can see from the skin, there's a vasoconstriction that can occur. And when there's a vasoconstriction, the oxygenated hemoglobin will be much decreased and the deoxyhemoglobin will be built up. And at the same time, depending on the CO2 concentration of the brain, the brain also auto-regulate or change the cerebral blood flow, which will be picked up by the AFNIRS measurement. And at the end, even though we expect this anticipated increase in HBO, we might get this no response. And this diagram also helps because you can see this light, actually, the pathway goes through the skin, scalp, bone, and other stuff and comes back. So it's not only the brain, but the mixture of these confounders.